Hello, welcome, thank you for coming. I'd also like to thank the organizers, and in particular, Christina Sermani, who invited me to speak on these ideas. Today, I'll be talking about the length of the shortest closed geodesic on positively curved two spheres. I'll say this is all joint work with Franco Vargas Payene. So here's an overview. This presentation has three videos. You're currently watching the first video. In this video, I'll try to give a really intuitive introduction to the problem. And we'll conclude with a statement of the main results. In the second video, I'm gonna sketch a proof of some of Regina Rotman's ideas. These are really beautiful ideas, very geometric proof. And the, ide the ideas are all important for the third part of the talk the third video where I'll give the details of our own proof. So we'll start with a question to the Groma, who asks if there's a constant depending only on the dimension, such that the length of the shortest periodic geodesic, we'll denote that by big L, on a closed Ramanian manifold M, is bounded above by this constant times the nth root of volume. Okay, that's quite a question to unpack. And so I will spend a good amount of time in this first video just trying to build the intuition for this type of question. Before we do that, let me say that we can ask a very similar question, um, except now where we use diameter instead of volume. So does there exist some other constant um, depending only on the dimension such that the length of the shortest closed geodesic is bounded above by that constant times the diameter of the manifold? So this is really the question that I'll be most interested in today. To start, so we're gonna start to build the intuition. We can ask whether we should expect a lower bound on this quantity, the length of the shortest closed geodesic on this closed Ramonian manifold. The answer here is no, or really that you can only expect a lower bound of zero. And the reason is because we can always pop ahead onto our manifold. That's what's happening in this image. So without sort of really changing the diameter or the volume of your manifold, you can introduce a head whose waist will be a closed geodesic. And we can shrink this waist down and therefore put sort of an arbitrarily small closed geodesic on a manifold with any size diameter and any volume. This image comes from a 2007 Sermani paper. So we can't expect a lower bound. This is Gromov's question again, which is, does there exist an upper bound on the length of the shortest closed geodesic in terms of the appropriate root of volume? And in order to try to start building intuition for this question, I'll start with sort of the first known result which is this 1949 result due to Lohner, who showed for any two torus, so you give me any metric on the two torus, that the length of the shortest closed geodesic is indeed bounded above by some constant times the square root of area. Okay, so Lohner says, if the class of closed manifolds you're considering are two tori, then the answer to Gromov's question is yes. We can bound the length of the shortest closed geodesic by some constant times the square root of area. And I'll note that this constant is approximately 1.07. A nice way to sort of restate the Lohner result is using the isosystolic ratio. So again, for this two torus, we can say that the ratio of the length of the shortest closed geodesic to the square root of area is bounded above by 1.07. This is just a reformulation of the above result. Okay, let's look at some examples. So the first example will be the uh, square torus. So if we look at the square torus, let me let this be a one by one um, square, then any of these vertical lines or any of these horizontal lines will be closed GD6. So the length of the shortest closed GD6 is equal to one. And the area of this torus, of course, equals one. 
And so that the isosystolic ratio, the ratio of the length to the square root of area, equals 1. And this is less than 1.07, which was uh, Lohner's upper bound for this isosystolic ratio. OK, so good. We've sort of verified that Lohner's result holds for the square torus. But as soon as you see this example, you might think, well, are there other tori where I can improve this ratio? And by improve it, I mean get it closer to what Lohner claims is the upper bound of 1.07. So maybe you can ask, is there a way to, say, fixing the length of the shortest closed GED to get one, can I drive down the area of my torus? And if you've never seen this type of question before, I think it's really fun to explore. And so I'd encourage you to pause the video right now and think for a minute. If there are some, you know, instead of the square torus, if I choose some other uh, flat torus, doesn't have to be flat, but the flat tori are the easiest to work with, um, can I improve this isosystolic ratio? Can I make the ratio of length of the shortest closed GD sig to root area bigger than one? Can I achieve 1.07? So I'll let you pause now. OK, welcome back. Hopefully you did some explorations. Um, let's think about some of the things you could have tried. Maybe you thought of a rectangular torus, where you left this side equal to 1, and we'll call this side equal to x, has length x. Now any of the vertical curves will be the shortest closed GD6. They'll have length equal to 1. And the area is now height times base equals to x. And x, as we've drawn it, is strictly bigger than 1. So that here, the isosystolic ratio, well, this is going to be strictly less than 1. So we've kept the length of the shortest closed GED sick equal to 1, but we actually increased the area. So the ratio went in the wrong direction. That's not what we wanted to do. So a rectangular torus uh, did not help us improve the isosystolic ratio. OK, let's try another torus. So maybe instead of um, a rectangle, I uh, shear my torus a little bit. So here's a sheared torus. And I'll keep the side lengths equal to 1. So now any of the horizontal curves, so I'll draw some of these in. These are short closed JD6. They have length equal to 1. And any of the sheared vertical curves will be short closed GD6, length equal to 1. So the length of the shortest closed GD6 is still equal to 1. But now I'll draw this height in. So this is a right triangle. We'll call this height h. The area will equal base times height, which is just 1 times h. And this will be strictly less than 1, because this is a right triangle with hypotenuse 1. So the isosystolic ratio is strictly greater than 1. We've moved in the right direction. And the question is, well, can we achieve Lohner's um, upper bound on this ratio of 1.07? The answer is yes. So I just need to shear a little bit more. Let me draw this um, equilateral torus for you. So here's a torus made out of two equilateral triangles. So this angle is 60. Again, any of the horizontal lines and any of the sheared vertical lines are closed JD6. So length is still equal to 1. And area, so here's the height. If this is 1, um, area, which equals h times 1, will be root 3 over 2. So that my isosystolic ratio, length over square root area, will indeed equal um, Lohner's constant, 2 to the 1 half over 3 to the 1 quarter. So this equilateral torus um, achieves Lohner's upper bound on this uh, isosystolic ratio. And the reason it does it, so if you think about this for a minute, you could continue shearing this torus and make this angle less than 60. But when you do that, 
you will continue to drive down the area. The height will be reduced and therefore the area of the torus is reduced. But you start driving down the length of the shortest closed geodesic as well. Because this diagonal here, as you shear the torus beyond 60 degrees, the diagonal will, which is currently one, because this is an equilateral torus, uh, the diagonal will fall below one and you won't be able to improve this ratio anymore. Okay, so that was a big example to start with, but I think it's a really illustrative example um, in thinking about why you might hope to be able to bound the length of the shortest closed geodesic from above by an appropriate root of area. Um, and then looking at this specific case of the two torus, seeing that a positive result does exist, and indeed it's sharp in the sense that this equilateral torus realizes the upper bound. Okay, so this next slide goes through a handful of additional um, volume bounds, so upper bounds on the length of the shortest closed geodesic in terms of the appropriate root of volume. I'll quickly go through this because as I said previously, I'm really more interested in the diameter bounds. So around the same time as Lohner, 1952, uh, Pugh, which is, who was one of Lohner's students, proved a very similar result for RP2 um, with a quality, again, if and only if uh, you have the standard metric on RP2. So this is a sharp isosystolic uh, inequality. And then Gromov in 1983, um, proved this result. He said the length of the shortest closed geodesic is indeed bounded above by a constant depending only on the dimension times the nth root of volume. And this is for essential manifolds. So essential manifolds, I'll give you some examples. Um, all the closed surfaces other than the uh, sphere. RPN is an essential manifold for in all dimensions n. And an important character characteristic of essential manifolds is that they have to be non-simply connected. So Gromov gives a very strong answer to his question. He says yes in the, in the setting of essential manifolds, but he leaves open the question in, uh, for simply connected manifolds. And indeed, for simply connected manifolds, the only curvature for free bounds that are known are for the two-sphere. So the first comes in 1988, where Croak gives the first such bound, he says that the length of the shortest closed geodesic on a two sphere is bounded above by 31 times square root area. And then Crookes' result is improved a handful of times. So first by Nabotovsky and Rotman in 2002 and independently Severo in 2004 to eight times square root area. And then most recently by Regina Rotman in 2006 to four root two times square root area. It's not thought that Rotman's bound is sharp. Um, she actually talks a little bit about these bounds in, in her talk. Okay, so I'll move on. This is just a restatement of Gromov's question for the diameter bound. Again, we're wondering if there's some constant depending only on dimension, such that the length of the shortest closed geodesic is bound above by that constant times the diameter. Again, the non-simply connected setting um, is where the strongest results exist. So here, the shortest non-contractible closed curve is always a periodic geodesic with length bounded above by twice the diameter. So this is sort of a, a very strong answer to this question. If your manifold has non-trivial fundamental group, then yes, you can bound the length of the shortest closed geodesic from above by two times the diameter. That means that all the interesting questions happen in, for simply connected manifolds. And again, the only known curvature free bounds are for the two sphere. So the first such result is again in this 1988 paper by Croak, who shows that the length of the shortest closed geodesic on two spheres is bounded above by nine times the diameter. And in his paper, he says that this uh, bound is not sharp. You can probably improve this using his own techniques. And Maeda does exactly that and improves it to five times the diameter. And then most recently, Nabutovsky and Rotman in 2002 and independently Samaro in 2004 show that the length of the shortest closed geodesic on a two sphere is bounded above by four times the diameter. So 
So you may wonder at this point, well, what is the sharp bound? And a reasonable guess is that the bound should be two times the diameter. Indeed, the round sphere achieves this bound. The round sphere has all GD6 closed of length equals two times the diameter. Um, it would be a really nice result. However, that's not true. So Balanchev, Croak, and Katz in 2009 um, give us this kind of wild result. They show the existence of metrics on the two sphere where the length of the shortest closed JD sick is strictly greater than two times the diameter. You know, before they produced these results, I think it was very believable that the bound on the length of the shortest closed JD sick for two spheres was two times the diameter. These examples that Balchev, Croak, and Katz produced, I think, surprised a lot of people. Um, their examples are Zoll metrics. So all GD6 are closed and of the same length. Um, and they're smooth perturbations away from the round sphere. What's interesting about their result is that it's not constructive. So they, they can't actually produce these examples. It's an existence result. And we don't actually know how much bigger than two times the diameter the length could be. So that leads us into the statement of our own results. So here are the main results. The first one that I'll share is that positively curved two spheres have length of the shortest closed GD stick bounded above by three times the diameter. So what you see happening here is we introduce a curvature condition. So all the previous results were curvature free bounds. By introducing this additional assumption on the curvature, we're able to improve the bound from four times the diameter to three times the diameter. And Regina mentions this result in her talk and notes that it's probably most interesting when viewed in light of the Balachev Crow Cats counterexamples. Um, and this is because their examples, at least initially, being smooth deformations of the round sphere, have positive curvature. So our theorem applies. And what we can say is that in these examples, even though they're able to push the length of the shortest closed GD sick strictly greater than twice the diameter, our result says they can't push it uh, beyond three times the diameter. However, something strange happens here, which is that, so their Zoll spheres are Gaiman deformations, which means that you're perturbing the round sphere in the direction of an odd function. And it's kind of unclear as you perturb um, what breaks first, whether your sphere will lose the Zoll property, and then it's sort of hard to say what the length of the shortest closed geodesic is, or whether your sphere will lose the positive curvature property. So it's possible that in their examples, if you're trying to sort of push the length of the shortest closed geodesic as far beyond twice the diameter as you can, that you can deform the round sphere through Zoll metrics to a point where the Zoll spheres are no longer positively curved and our result doesn't apply. Indeed, the Zoll condition doesn't put any restriction on curvature. It's known that sort of Zoll's initial family of examples, which are these rotationally symmetric examples, um, allow negative curvature. So maybe the open question at this point, and this is something that Franco and I thought about um, at length and were unable to answer, is whether we could show for all Zoll two spheres that the length is bounded above by three times the diameter, not just for the positively curved Zoll spheres. Um, the Zoll condition is so strong, but we were unable to sort of apply it directly to improve the bound from 4D to 3D. Okay. So the second main result I'll share with you is um, sort of similar. We say we, sh we strengthen our condition. So not just positively curved, but we require a, a pinched curvature metric with pinching constant at least 0.83. So in this setting, we're able to prove this bound, that the length of the shortest closed GD stick is bounded above by this constant, depending on the pinching constant times the diameter. 
And okay, the result's kind of uninteresting until you plug some numbers in. So at the low end of where our result is applicable, we get a bound of 2.34 times the diameter. So again, continuing to improve this constant. But we'll note that our result isn't sharp in the sense that when you plug in pinching constant 1, which corresponds to the round sphere, we get a bound on the length of shortest closed GD of 2.26 times the diameter, whereas we know that the round sphere has um, length equal to twice the diameter. So our result is not sharp in this sense. OK, I'll end this section with some further reading. So all of these are uh, good references at this point, if you want to go read a little more. And I hope to see you in the second video, where I'll continue to explore these ideas.